Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'm going to take a slight departure from our Roman series, studies, videos, uh, verse by verse in Romans. This video is not going to be about prophecy. It's not going to be about our verse by verse study through Romans. This is going to be a separate video, uh, somewhat unique in a certain sense. I just want to talk to you. I want to take a departure from everything and just talk to you. I want to talk about where modern Christianity has missed the mark. I want to talk about truths that are seldom today taught. In fact, I'm going to go through 20 uh, items of interest. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these at, at the end of this video on the screen so that you can look at the scripture references that I've listed to back up my claims, to back up what I've what I've said in this video. And I believe that these are truths that every child of God really needs to know if there is to be healthy spiritual growth and grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're getting closer and closer by the moment to our being caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. If you've if you followed this channel and you've looked at along with us, if you've looked at all of the evidence that leans in favor of our soon departure, then I want to thank you for that, and I want you to realize that it's not just about prophecy. Our relationship with Christ is one that is so vital and so important that it is, it is my desire that many of our followers come to understand certain particular elements that pertain to the Christian's life in Christ so that when we do stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, we can carry these truths with us from here when we go. And we won't stand before God having not known or having never really fully comprehended our position in Christ and the wonders of his grace. These videos, they don't get a lot of views. Um, and that's fine. And I'll talk about that at the end of the video, why I, I believe that that is not something, at least not something that we here at Blessed Hope Forever should concern ourselves with. If these videos only got a half a dozen views and it helped one individual, it would be worth its weight in gold. So, therefore, I want to start from the beginning and I want you to just listen to me. It's not going to be any fancy graphics or anything here. Uh, many, many Christians would find this boring and dry, but... Uh, I assure you that this this is not. So I'm going to go through these point by point. Number one, the first thing that I want to say is that the most, and, the, and this I believe is the most serious point of all. That's why it's I've listed this as number one. The most serious. We are born again by the will of God. Now, Faith being a result of that new birth, the gospel. This is the gospel. The natural man is in bondage to his fallen will. God's grace, folks, is central to the gospel. And so I could list these verses now to substantiate what I'm claiming. But you'll, you'll find this, as I said, at the end of the video. I'm just going to go through these points, and, 
without listing uh, scriptural references as I go. But I have gone to great pains to make sure that I have included chapter and verse to substantiate everything that I'm saying. So number one is that God's grace is central to the gospel. We were born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. That's number one. So let's look at number two. There's a reason for that. And that is that man is spiritually dead and must be quickened to life. It's the spiritual picture of resurrection, folks. Now, most Christians would have no problem in seeing that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But they have a huge problem when it comes to them believing that Christ had to bring them to life, raise them to life, quicken them to life, because they were spiritually dead. Now, I'm sorry, but I have to scratch my head over that. I don't see why they would not have a problem with the one, Lazarus, and yet they seem to have a problem when it comes to themselves. The reason for that is that they don't understand that they are dead. Theologically speaking, uh, it, we're talking about total depravity, that we are born spiritually dead, that the natural man cannot hear or believe. So that's number two on our list of things. And I hope that you will find these comforting and encouraging as we go along. Number three is that God chose us. We did not choose God. It just goes along with all the rest. No man seeks after God. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Yes, we were predestined. This is not a man-made invent invention. It's scripture. We were called. We were justified. The spiritual picture of Jesus choosing his disciples, it's no different in our lives. Jesus chose his disciples. And once again, Christians won't have a problem when they look at that and they see that Jesus chose his disciples. But when we talk about him choosing us, now all of a sudden there's a problem. And again, I have to scratch my head. And I wonder... And I constantly wonder, but I always come back around to, to realizing, reminding myself of the fact that it is man that takes himself so seriously. So number four on our list, number four is all three of the following realities are a work of God. All three are our physical birth, you coming forth out of your mother's womb our new birth, or born-again experience, and our heavenly celestial birth, what I've coined the term heavenly celestial birth, the rapture, of which we had and will have nothing to do with. That's just the fact of the matter. We had no choice in either one of those three. Number five on our list. Number five is... God has forgiven us of all sin, past and future. Not just past, but future as well. It was all nailed to his tree. Our sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea, to be remembered no more. The sin issue, folks, has been forever settled. That's just a fact. Yet Christian after Christian continues to bemoan his failure and his sin. So, we go on to number six. And number six is we are made the righteousness of God in Christ. We are in fact called saints. We stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. 
There are a multitude of Christians who do not understand this, who do not accept this, who do not believe this. Some have never heard of this. Some have and just don't believe this when it is a bedrock truth of Scripture. We stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. He calls us saints. In fact, I challenge every one of you to look at Paul's epistles where that almost without exception and at the beginning, the introduction of each epistle were called saints. God doesn't mince words. He doesn't call us something that we're not. We are saints and we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's pretty righteous. And this position is unchangeable. You can't change it. Nothing could ever change that position. Number seven on our list, our new nature, the new creation. It did not eradicate our sinful nature just because we were made a new creation in Christ. That did not eradicate or do away with our sinful nature. And the two natures are in constant conflict with one another. Constant conflict. They're at war with one another. And this is a fascinating topic because most Christians today believe that we are single-natured individuals. We are not. The non-believer folks who has not come into a saving relationship with Christ only has one nature. They are the single-natured individual. We are dual-natured individuals. We have a new nature. But God did not remove the old. And there's a reason why he did not remove that which so disturbs you most of the time. It actually serves a purpose in your life. So the two are in constant conflict with one another. Next on our list, number eight. God has nothing to do with our old nature. He has nothing to do with the flesh. God has nothing to do with it. It will never change, but will only become worse over time. Scripture bears this out plainly. The Christian life is not cleaning up the old man. It's why we had to be made a new creation where Christ could dwell or abide. Many of you are familiar with the fact that New wine is not put in old wineskins. That's the picture. The reason why we had to be given a new nature, made a new creation, is because Christ could not dwell in a single-natured individual. He can't be touched by sin. So we have him living in the new man, the righteous new man, the sinless new man. That's where we abide. That's where he abides. That's where he took up his abode. And the new man cannot sin. That is a straightforward fact from Scripture. And you'll find, as I said, you'll find all these Scripture references at the end of the video that are associated with all the points that I'm making here. And then we come to number nine. Number nine is a truth that few Christians today are even aware of. We are to daily reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive unto God. It is a daily ongoing activity. It's a vital ongoing activity. And believe it or not, it is the first command given us in Romans. Romans chapter 6 verse 11. It's the first time that the imperative mood appears in the grammar. It's the first command that we're given. And I find that extremely interesting that the first command that God gives us in Romans is to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Number 10. Number 10 is a, also an unfamiliar truth. It's something that Christians will do well to grasp, and that is all righteousness is of the Lord. All righteousness is of God. His righteousness is, is imputed unto us. 
And that same righteousness, the same identical righteousness, becomes evident in our experience, where he refers to it as our righteousness, as we believe in and trust in him, because it comes through faith. It is the righteousness that is based on faith, not law. We can never become any more righteous by what we do or don't do. In fact, uh, it's it's akin to somewhat akin, I guess, to us. You know, if, if you understand that we are saints, the question that could rightly be asked, how, how do we become more saintful than what we are? How, how do we become more righteous than what we are? I mean, how righteous is the righteousness of God? And we've been made the righteousness of God. We can't become any more righteous than what we are. We can't become any more of a saint than what we are. We cannot become any more righteous by what we do or don't do. Next on our list is number 11. <clears throat> number 11 is that this righteousness of God it's actually manifest in and through our lives through two means. One is the fruit of the Spirit, which most people are aware of, and the manifest life of Christ himself. These two are, are distinctly separate and apart. They're not the same thing. The Bible talks about both, not just the fruit of the Spirit, but Christ himself manifest. If you stop and think about that for a moment, you, you if you're like me, you may not even have words to express that the reality of that. It is such a sobering thought that Christ himself would manifest himself through our life. But that's exactly what the Bible says. As branches, we are to abide in the vine, he being the vine, through whom it is produced. Next on our list is number 12. Number 12 is that we are to rest in God's timing as it regards our spiritual growth. Rest in God's timing as it regards our spiritual growth. Not be over anxious, not be unsettled as to the pace that we see that he's taking us through. It's one of the most difficult things, I believe, for the Christian to do. But we're told in Hebrews to labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. I've always believed that the reason why the Holy Spirit uses the word labor is because it is the labor. It's hard. We have to work hard at resting in God's timing because we want to run ahead of God. We want to see more progress in our lives than what we might typically at any given point see. So we are to rest in God's timing as it regards our spiritual growth. And this includes times of dryness and desert, which we pass through. Next on our list is number 13. We've died not only to sin, but we've died to self. We've died to the law. We've died to the world. We've died to Satan. And we've died to death. Yes, that's, that's right. We've died to death. Scripture lists six things that we've died to, that the Christian, the believer in Christ, has died to. Sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. And unless we've died to the law, we cannot live unto God. And I'm speaking in the experiential sense. We've died to all of this positionally, but in our experience, we may still live as though we are alive unto the law, or alive unto sin, or alive unto self, or alive unto Satan, we're alive unto the world, but we've died, crucified with Christ. 
Next on our list is number 14, and that is that the law serves no place in the believer's life except to drive us to Christ, who is our life. In fact, the law was never given to the church. It was never given to Christians to begin with. Christians become confused when they open their Bible and they see a whole lot of instruction, and they see that the Bible is just full of do this and don't do that, and they fail to understand, and rightly so, because it is something that we have to grow into understanding, grow to the point of believing that it is a picture of, a lovely picture of our Lord who lives his life in and through our lives. It's, in short, it's a portrait. We're looking at a portrait, a picture of his life. And if we did not have the thou shalt and thou shalt nots, we would have no picture of him at all. Very little picture of him at all. It's been rightly said that the Bible is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, but it is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of Christ. And that is very true. So law serves no place in the believer's life, except to drive us to Christ, who is our life. It will do that. And through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And in fact, the very strength of sin, what gives strength its power, is the law. Most Christians are not aware of that fact. They're not aware of the fact, somehow it missed their they're understanding that the law is not made for a righteous man, which is who we are. So that's an important point as well. That brings us to number 15. Number 15. God always loves us. He always loves you. He doesn't allow anything to touch your life, except it be for your ultimate good. He always has our best in mind. He knows the paths that we take, and, and when he's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. He bottles your tears. He always causes us to triumph. These are precious truths that assist us in growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The believer living under the law has little to do with any of this. In fact, for some strange odd reason, they don't even find these truths comforting. But I know many of you out there do. Many of you have written me, telling me how that these, these truths have affected your life, they've impacted your life in a positive spiritual way. And this is why I continue to, to keep, this is why I keep doing this. You people are encouraging me to keep putting the truth out there because our Lord's coming is near. And I, I just, my one of my burdens is that Christians will come to understand these truths in a deeper way before our Lord returns for us. Next on our list is number 16. God is supremely sovereign. Over every minute particle, every minute detail of our lives, he promises to complete that which he began in us. He promises to remain faithful even when we are not. He promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Heaven is certain and assured, and these are truths that we can take comfort in all the day long every day of our lives. Number 17. We are to enter into this rest, ceasing from our own works as Christ did from his when he lived in complete dependence upon the Father who worked through him. Now, I've, I've just, I've got to stop here for a moment. And I want you people to think about this, that our Lord himself did not work apart from the, the Father. He, he lived in full, complete 
in, in complete dependence upon the Father. It was the Father doing His works through Him. And yet, somehow, somehow, Christians today believe that they can do something that Christ didn't. I apologize. I had to pause for effect there. That is such an important truth. I, I, I just I wish that people could just grasp that fact. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat that. Christ lived in full dependence upon the Father who worked through Christ. And yet somehow, Christians today believe that the process in their case is different. And I'm telling you it's not. We are no different. Christ is our life, our very life. He's not our example. Example means copy. You know, he did, we see what he did, we do it in the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. Example is law. Life is grace. Number 18. The modern human merit-based religious system today is primarily one of law and self-righteousness. It's primarily one which ignores many of the truths that I've presented to you here. It's the same system that our Lord confronted during his life. In fact, there's been entire books, not just chapters, written to address this issue, this problem. Hundreds more verses woven throughout the word from Genesis to Revelation showing us that this is the case. Number 19, the believer living under grace, not law, undergoes the same identical subject of persecution by this world religious system as Jesus Christ himself did. It is an unjustified hatred without a cause and number 20 number 20 it doesn't go without purpose because such persecution leads to further spiritual growth in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ so that's it I've, these are the 20 things that I've compiled that I've attached scripture verses to these verses are plain clear, straightforward uh, verses from Scripture. Uh, they're, in fact, so simple that even a babe can understand. Uh, it doesn't take someone with a Ph.D. to decipher the message. It doesn't take someone, it doesn't take some Einstein to try to, you know, interpret these verses. These verses are very plain, very straightforward, very clear, and to the point, very simple. It's not hard. They're not hard to understand. If you look up these verses that I will list, it, show at the end of, the, of this video, if you look these up, you will see that every single thing that I said is backed up by the Word of God. Now, ha after having gone through these 20 things, I, I do not feel qualified at all to present a summary of all this. Why? Because the grace of God, once seen, becomes so overwhelming, we just can't stand back far enough to see it all. Yet, sadly, most of the professing Christianity today has received little more than a slight glimpse of God's grace, if they've received any light on the subject at all, or or perhaps they even have the wrong definition of grace. They don't just, they really just don't understand grace at all. I want to say it's not any minister's job to tell you what they think that you should stop doing or what you, sh you should do. You know, to, to stop doing this and to start doing that. We have not been called to do that, folks. I don't care how many church services that you've been to. 
or you've heard that. That is not our calling. I want you to take note of, of an important fact. I have not once told you what I believe you should do or not do. Yet I've given you an enormous smorgasbord of grace truth. What I've done is simply quoted chapter and verse and given you truthful facts describing how our lives are governed by God's grace, the principle of grace. And how you react or respond to this is entirely up to you. I have the utmost confidence that any truth that was spoken will not return unto God void. I have no interest, I have zero interest at all in anyone believing something just because I believe it to be true. And the truths concerning God's grace in our lives and His will for our lives does not need to be accompanied by or complemented with that which entertains the eye. Folks, these are matters of the heart, and they are, they are, for none but the hungry heart. I love you all, I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for listening.